Hi, my name is Stephen Van Tassel. I'm Program Coordinator for Wildlife Damage Management at the School of Natural Resources, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We're here in Alfalfa Field in northeastern Nebraska. And this is prime pocket gopher country because pocket gophers love alfalfa fields. We're going to be beginning with talking about how to identify a pocket gopher mound, where to find that plug because the plug is critical for finding to get into that main burrow system where you need to be setting your traps or putting your toxic in depending on which method you want to use. So why don't we begin looking at a pocket gopher mound. Before we can begin talking about controlling the pocket gophers, we have to identify the mounds correctly so that we're not confusing a mole mound with a pocket gopher mound. We have a, a representative pocket gopher mound right here, and you'll notice something distinctive about the shape, and that is it's an oblong shape or a, what's called a fan or kidney shape. Notice the sort of teardrop design here, and if you look carefully, you'll notice the plug this, you won't be able to see this on all of the mounds, but what happens is the pocket gopher is coming out of the ground at a 45 degree angle and he's throwing the dirt. This is why I've positioned myself on the fan side of the mound so that way when I take my probe I can dig probe down to find where it's where I get less resistance and that's where the pocket gopher's tunnel is and you can see how my uh, screwdriver here slides very quickly. If you don't have a screwdriver such as this, this is probably a 12 inch screwdriver, you can buy other probes like this and simply probe around to find where you get down to that main to that main tunnel. But I want you to be sure that you understand how a pocket gopher mound works is that one side of the mound is going to have a lot more soil than the other and the reason is the pocket gopher doesn't throw dirt behind himself, he only pushes it out this particular way. So when we're trying to identify where that lateral tunnel is, we'd want to make sure we position ourselves on the flat on the larger side and then probe this way to find that spot where we get less resistance. And you just keep probing till you find where that hole where that hole is. There it is. There's our hole. This is called the lateral tunnel, and we dig that out until we get down to the main tunnel, and that may be down 12 to 14 inches depending on the soil conditions in your area. And you keep digging until you find the main tunnel. And the main tunnel is going to branch off in two directions. Because of the other mounds here, I'm expecting the main run to be somewhere in here. Now that we have the lateral tunnel opened down to the main tunnel, which is located here, we have two options to control these pocket gophers. One of them is with traps, of course, or we have the option of using toxicants. I'm going to begin talking about setting a trap here. And again, this is for trapping the lateral, the lateral tunnel. So this is a DK1, and I'm going to take this trap set it here quickly. Notice I have a wire cable. Do not use string because pocket gophers that are trapped can chew through that. It has to be a wire cable. And then we take the bend the wire around. So now we have it set. It's not sort of configured yet because I got to move the trigger back to it's just about ready to let the let the dog go. This piece here is called a dog. Now my trap is set. I put it down tines first. Again, I want to try to get a feel for where that main tunnel is. And I want the trap to be placed just prior to entering the main tunnel. Then I can take the, take the wire with my surveyor's flag and secure it down. Now some of you may have heard that we need to cover this hole. The research that I've done shows that there's no statistical difference between effectiveness with leaving the tunnel open or leaving it closed. The only reason why I would close this tunnel is if I was worried about children getting access or pets having access. But we're out here in the middle of, a, of an alfalfa field, no one's going to be walking through here, so I'm not worried about someone being injured. But if I was in a more urban area, I would cover this to protect children and pets. Even though there's no bait, someone may hurt themselves by putting their foot into this hole of not 
they're not looking where they're going. But that's all there is, and I would just simply check this each day. Now we're not suggesting one variety of trap more is better than another. It's a lot of it's just personal preference in your own particular interests. Um, I just picked the DK1. Uh, I, my research should use the DK1 as well as the Maccabi. This is the Maccabi trap. This is the DK1. I believe this is called the Easy Set. There are a whole host of pocket gopher, pocket gopher traps available. They all, they all work. They all have their pros and cons and different co cost points. It's just a matter of personal preference. But again, the process for setting them all, learn about how to do that, but setting them all into the tunnel is, is exactly the same. You just simply put tines down first and then make sure you stake it properly with your surveyor's flag or something more substantive and always use a wire not a cord because you don't want the pocket gopher biting through it now in the lateral tunnel we can also use toxicants rather than setting traps and here we have a zinc phosphide bait and as well as uh, phosphine, uh, Phostec phosphine tablets that can be placed. This is for a fumigation. Remember, you need a fumigation management plan when you're using this particular product. But I want to focus here on the toxic baits. Again, you'd want to dig out that lateral tunnel down to the main tunnel, and then you'd put a teaspoon of uh, oats, treated oats, onto your spoon. You would take that down into the main tunnel, put it, pour it over, and then you would close the burrow, making sure that you don't cover the oats. That's critical because if you bury the bait, the pocket gopher won't be able to find it. You would also want to make sure you're doing this during a time when the soil is dry and you're not anticipating any rain in the next several days. Zinc phosphide is moisture sensitive. And so if you're worried about moisture in your cropland, you'd want to go to one of the anticoagulant baits that's available. I believe it's difacinone uh, is available for controlling pocket gophers, or it might be chlorofacinone. But you'd want to go with a uh, waxed, waxed bait for the pocket gopher rather than using zinc phosphide if moisture is a concern in your area. We talked about putting traps and bait down the lateral tunnel to the main tunnel. Now we're gonna do a different, show you a different process of what's called hand baiting going to the main tunnel directly. Now the key to finding the main tunnel is to recognize how pocket gophers build their tunnel systems. As we said before, the lateral tunnel comes off at a 45 degree angle from the main tunnel. So you'll notice a mound here and a mound here. These are crushed by tire tracks because they recently mowed today, but we know that the main tunnel's got to be in between these. So if we probe down with our narrow end, this has a narrow end and a fatter end, we go down the narrow end, see how it dropped? That shows you we made the main, we found the main tunnel. Then we'd flip it over, widen it out, and then we take our spoon with toxicant, pour it down into the hole, then kick it shut. That's basically all you do. You just keep doing that according to the label and you'd put that fresh. Make sure you watch when you're using zinc phosphide, make sure the soil is dry, that you're not expecting rain anytime soon. You'll notice I'm wearing the nitrile gloves this time. The reason is because I'd be in closer proximity to the poison using this particular technique than I was using the lateral tunnels, but I didn't, the label did not require me to have nitrile gloves when I was using a spoon, but I'm wearing them now just to sort of remind you that some of your labels will require you to wear nitrile gloves when using that particular toxicant. To save a step from using the spoon, there's another device that uses the same principle, but the toxicant is inside this storage chamber, and when you press the button, it comes out the bottom. So again, we push down, push down, find that spot where you get down into the main tunnel, because we notice we have a mound here, we have a mound here, so we find it, lift it up slightly, push the button, make sure enough toxicant comes out, pull it out, kick it closed, voila, we have now baited this particular spot with, uh, for pocket gophers. So let's summarize what we have for pocket gopher control. Number one, we want to identify the mounds correctly. They should be oblong, kidney-shaped, or fan-shaped. We want to find the plug, which will be on the opposite end of the large pile of soil. Secondly, we want to find the main runs, which will be in between the, the rows of pocket gopher mounds. Secondly, we want to be sure that we are using the toxicants appropriately or the traps appropriately. If we're using zinc phosphide, it needs to be done during dry conditions. If we're using an anticoagulant, we can use, use it in moisture conditions. 
There is also, if we're using uh, fumigants, such as phostoxin, we wanna make sure we're using our, ha have our fumigation management plan established prior to our using the particular poison. And make sure if you're using traps, you properly stake your traps with a surveyor's flag securely against with a metal wire. Check your traps regularly and you'll find you'll have trapping success or poisoning success as long as you're determined and find those fresh mounds.